Good evening, and I want uh, to give us the opportunity to take a deep breath and center into this space. So let us all, and I invite you to make your breath a prayer, that as you inhale, you are inviting the Holy Spirit into your space, and as you exhale, you are letting everything else go. You have nothing else to do but sit and worship God on this holiest of days. And let us use this uh, time to give over to God what we need to as Dave plays for us. So welcome to worship. I want to the folks who are here in person and the folks who are joining us from home, uh, watching us on YouTube. And I uh, visited with somebody this afternoon who uh, joins us every week and last night uh, through YouTube and is so grateful for uh, that we are, are doing this. And so I want to uh, honor and welcome whether we are here or online. Uh, for those who are home, you might want to light a candle in your space. Uh, today we are going to tell the story of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion, continuing from the vantage point of the Gospel of John. Uh, there will be no slides, or, which is PowerPoint, li PowerPoint lingo, for the uh, scripture readings, unless we're uh, reading things in unison. Uh, but so you're invited to open your pew Bibles if you would like to follow along, and we will be reading from the NRSV. Uh, we will be uh, confessing and pardoning a few times and in different ways throughout the service. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Jesus, friend, Savior, Teacher, Lord, 
beloved, we gather to honor your sacrifice, to not take it or you for granted, to walk with you through the suffering, to imagine, recreate, appreciate, be rightly horrified and moved by who you were and are and how you love us. Breathe life into our worship. Speak through the words and in the silences. Lord, speak to us. We are listening. Amen. The, uh, the first uh, scripture reading tonight is from uh, John, chapter 18, verses 1 to 34. 1, 1 to 14. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there and with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. So you'll notice that in the Gospel of John, there is no kiss. You'll notice that Jesus is the conductor of this event. You'll also notice that the first one to resort to violence is Peter. And he is scolded by Jesus. Scripture asks us, especially as we live in a world saturated with violence, not unlike that of Jesus' time with the Roman Empire. When did Jesus raise a fist? When did he call to arms? We sit tonight horrified by the violence that will be inflicted on our Savior. What would Jesus' call be to us today? How is he calling us to put down the sword? Let us pray. For all the ways that we are complicit to the violence in this world or have just accepted it as a given. Lord, forgive us. In your name we pray. Amen. After the men put down the rocks, after Jesus asked them, the one without sin, 
be the first to throw the stone. Jesus turned to the woman, sin no more. We are forgiven and given a mandate. In Jesus' name, let us be peacemakers and bless the world. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. And now for our second scripture lesson. John 18, 15 to 18. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. And continuing with verse 19. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Continuing uh, with verse uh, 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of those, uh, one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. You'll notice that Jesus tells the high priest to ask those who know him what they say about him, while at the same time, Peter, who knows everything that Jesus has said, denies even knowing him. The ones who could speak up were too afraid. You'll also notice that Peter denies Jesus around a fire, and at the end of the gospel, when Peter is asked by Jesus three times, do you love me? It will be around a fire. The question for us in terms of confession, how do we deny Christ? When do we let fear interfere with our witness? And we've all done it. Why don't you sit with that for a second? For our assurance of pardon, um, there is something different for, I can declare it to you from up here, but there is something different for somebody looking at you in the eyes and reassuring you, in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven 
and I know this is, might be uncomfortable for some, but I would encourage you to turn to a neighbor, and some folks might have to move, but to look at someone, take turns, and look at one another in the eye as if this person desperately needs to hear this. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. peace of Christ be with you. I'd like to invite Ruth forward for our next scripture lesson. John 18, 28 to 38. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? What is truth? I'll say more about Pilate in a minute, but let's use his question to ponder our own truths. What truth does our life declare? What gospel does our life proclaim? What is the truth of our lives? What might be our epitaph? Seeking to be faithful, they were still in need of a savior. For our assurance, reading from Romans 5, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. The grace of God has the last word. Continuing in chapter 18. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. 
Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. Barabbas was a bandit, not a common thief, not a swarthy, swashbuckling Robin Hood, more than likely a zealot who sought to overthrow the Roman Empire. The people wanted revolution. Pilate is painted in a very kind light in the Gospel of John, almost as if he is a victim of circumstance. Historical accounts of him were not so kind. He was a cruel man. At the time the gospel was written, the Jesus followers were put out of the synagogue, so there's no love lost for the Jewish authorities, the religious establishment, which is evident. And the Jewish rebellion of the year 70 has already happened. The Jews were decimated and the temple destroyed. And scholars wonder if this is why Pilate was written in such a kind light so as not to further antagonize Rome. We'll uh, continue now with the uh, second half of verse 16 in uh, John 19. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. 
Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to, for, for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Our final reading is from John 19, 31 to 42. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let us pray. Crucified Lord, their story is our story. We would have been no different. We would not have acted differently. We sit with this truth. And if our souls can bear it, we would imagine a world with no you to pray to. And still we will pray until the sun rises again on Easter morn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.